Hello everybody, welcome back to the Florence School of Banking and Finance uh, series of online webinars. Uh, we're sorry for the little delay, we had a few technical issues, but we're here now and everything appears to be working. Uh, so if you were with us last week, um, you'll know that this week we will be entering the world of contingent convertible debt instruments, otherwise known as COCO. And back to guide us through this world is Enrico Perotti from the University of Amsterdam. Enrico, how are you today? I'm very good. Excellent. Well, we have uh, 50 participants. Now, if you want to see last week's webinar, you can see that at the Florence School of Banking and Finance YouTube channel. And for more information about the school, you can visit fbf.eui.eu. But for now, we'll hand over to Enrico for the presentation. And please do pay attention because we'll be polling you throughout. And we'll be back at the end of the presentation in about half an hour to take your questions. So you can fill them up in the question bar below our heads here. And we'll be keen to take those at the end. So. I'll be saying goodbye now, and I'll see you again in about half an hour. Enrico, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, welcome to everybody, including the known faces. Uh, glad to be uh, doing this. Uh, last uh, lecture was very much about why it is important for risk-absorbing capital um, to be having a positive effect on risk incentive. That remains the spirit in which I've uh, approached studying cocoa. There's something different about cocoa relative to um, traditional debt and certainly even believable debt. We discussed the beneficial effect of contractual terms that convert as going concern as opposed to just, you know, take losses at default which is still overwhelming the framework in which legislators, commentators, and uh, some regulators seem to take. So I hope we'll, we'll sort of get to this issue. But today, after, so last class we discussed why is it that the buffer view is a very incomplete way to think about how bank capital has an effect on risk. And we took explicitly the example why believing about that doesn't really help in controlling risk, Example, although, of course, it helps to, uh, to assign losses exposed. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a mixed instrument, uh, and a particularly interesting one. I've done work on it with uh, uh, Natalia Martinova. Um, so it's going to be about cocoa nuts, uh, cocoa bonds. So um, cocoa is part of the European framework not the US framework for risk absorption capital. Uh, the key point of COCO is that it's designed by legislation to qualify as long as it's essentially uh, resemble equity in many ways. It has to be very junior, it cannot be secure, it cannot be guaranteed, you cannot enhance is um, um, it's um, a sort of credit worthiness in any way to try to get it cheaper. Uh, it has to be risk-bearing. It has to be perpetual, in principle. It's, of course, callable, but uh, with no incentive to redeem. And it cannot be called in the first five years, so there's a real commitment of capital there. That's the difference between capital and financing. There is a long-term commitment. And, of course, what is special about this form of debt is that upon the trigger event, it must uh, be converted uh, um, to either written off partially or totally or converted to core one capital. So, a lot of funny business there. Uh, it's also in, um, so there are two ways in which you have equity component here. Uh, it, it can absorb losses before, in fact, even default. Um, by sort of being written off, it may be converted to equity, and also its coupon has to be discretionary and, and non-cumulative. This is um, a, essentially an equity-like feature. Uh, in any bad years, if there is not enough profitability, the bank is, uh, has no legal obligation to make a payment on the coupon, and very importantly, and unlike some form of preferred stock, which was a more conventional construction, these are non-cumulative, so once you miss it, you miss it. And the regulators have power there, indeed, to, to sort of make sure that when it's an appropriate uh, coupon may be cancelled. 
Now, these are the equity component, essentially. The discretionary payout, um, the fact that you have um, essentially a sort of deleveraging effect. Sorry, I don't know what happened here. Uh, a deleveraging effect upon the triggering. And then there is a third ingredient that tells you essentially how much equity there is, and that is the level of the trigger. So if the trigger is set sufficiently high, Coco has a high equity content because at least on the assumption that the trigger is activated um, uh, properly, um, it will um, the deleveraging will occur at a stage in which the bank is still viable, solvent in principle. It is a going concern. It's not gone. It's not in default. Too much of the language of legislators, and I think even um, and certainly journalists, is about what happens when the bank defaults. Um, what is really important here, and in the spirit of hopefully of Basel III, is to sort of act preventively instead of taking this uh, view that risk hits and then you know then we're dead and it's just a question who pays. I think we should do better than that. So Coco is, is a step in that direction, at least, you know, in principle. Uh, how exactly Coco takes losses at default? Um, the, uh, I mean, it's always converted. Terms can dictate whether it's converted into equity or believable debt, and that might make a slight difference, but uh, that's, uh, that's of lesser importance. Um, uh, for what we are covering now. Now, how does COCO qualify? So, the COCO is not admitted as core equity capital. There was a lot of discussion in Basel, remember, um, about whether it could be considered equity enough to qualify for core capital. It was ruled out, and I think appropriately, actually. Equity should be equity, should be equity. Now, on the other hand, there is an additional tier one which actually is very much designed, in a sense, for giving space to something like Coco or Prefer Share, which uh, would have very many equity-like components, even though, in, at least nominally, it's a dead instrument. I, um, I think the, and finally, you have the Tier 2. Uh, now, for Coco to qualify as Tier 1, it has to be that they produce absorption in a range of capital ratio in which the bank is going concerned. So well above, in a sense, uh, the, the area where you're about to breach your co one obligation. Um, so the COCO qualify for additional tier one have to be high buffer. Uh, the low buffer COCO, uh, which by the way, are the major uh, quite a large fraction of what is issued, qualify for the tier two, the sort of uh, uh, formal billing about that that may be issued um, as an additional requirement. Particularly, large banks are subject to this obligation. Now, um, what type of COCO are issued? Well, what you can see is that the the distribution over time of issues, well, first of all, there's been a remarkable build-up, uh, and it's been quite a good response for quite quite a few years. Um, they, and, and you can see you have both types. There has been a lot of cocoa, tier one cocoa issues at time where stress tests have sort of demanded more out of banks. And I think that's in part what reflects that. Uh, waves here. But they are, they're both important, as you can see. But there is still, I would say, a lot of tier two, uh, meaning a form of, it's a form of risk absorbing capital that is a little closer to Berlin about that, uh, by and large. OK, so what are characteristic of COCO? I owe this to uh, this graph to the BIS, uh, to a BIS study. It's neat. Uh, the better me graphs. So, what are the main features? First of all, the characteristic of the trigger and the characteristic of loss absorption. Let me start with the latter. So, as I say, loss absorption can um, uh, can 
imply that upon the trigger there is a conversion to equity or it's just a writing off or part of principle. They're both form of leveraging. One implies some, um, of course, some delusion. Um, on the on the trigger side, there are two type of trigger, potentially. It could be defined as uh, as uh, essentially uh, either mechanical or discretionary. Uh, I think this distinction is more in theory than in practice, and I'll explain later why. Um, discretionary means the regulator may decide to convert. Or in theory, even the, the firm could decide to convert. Uh, in fact, we have essentially automatic trigger by and large. Um, I take back, I don't think the, the bank would be allowed to have a discretionary trigger that would violate the principle. Um, so the mechanical trigger would be essentially activated either by a certain book, a book to book to asset value reaching some particular level or a market value. Trigger. Now, we'll come back to this. Now, what about the market? The market has been seen as a major innovation and quite frankly, uh, quite successful. Um, half a trillion has been issued uh, by large European banks. Um, it was deemed not to be a proper form of debt in the US and therefore not uh, entitled to uh, tax advantages and that seemed to have been enough to sort of kill it off in the US. Now one important distinction is if you compare with convertible debt uh, which is common subject of study in corporate finance, traditional convertible debt uh, assigns to the bondholders the right to convert in equity. So it's a case in which the bond will become converted into equity in the good times. And that's used for specific firms, especially risky firms. Uh, a cocoa, and of course it trades at a premium because you're giving a package which is a bond plus an option. A cocoa is a bond minus an option because the bondholders do not have the option <coughs> to convert. And in fact, conversion is automatically set to convert in the bad state. Uh, as a result, the package of the, uh, the COCO is a package of a conversional band, bond and a minus, uh, minus an option. And therefore it trades at a premium, uh, at a discount. Now the market uh, responded well, of course, as we can see that the US example, banks liked his tax deductibility, they could, took to it. Um, uh, it, importantly, and perhaps not entirely obviously, it does qualify as equity in the leverage ratio. That's a concession to, to the industry. Um, the investors initially in a time of very low yield saw the cocoa bond as a special asset in a low yield environment. Generally, people thought that you know the various level of um, core capital core additional preservation buffers would be high enough that conversion was unlikely. And they also deemed the regulator would not easily allow the large banks to become again as leveraged as they did. Um, now, we all are aware of the fact that the market all of a sudden after sort of smoothly absorbing huge amount of cocoa uh, with very high oversubscription of issues have been spooked, there's been price response that was quite sharp, suddenly upon some news that people thought to be troublesome, uh, you, uh, the price of cocoa on, um, for Deutsche Bank and uh, for, uh, for other banks, uh, Santander I think is here, it dropped quickly. I mean, if we were to look at the most recent data, actually the price really bounce back quite a bit. Uh, but still, you know, for say a bond instrument, this is pretty sharp response. And um, so, you know, people ask the question, how come they were, they were so spooked? Could it be that the, 
the cocoa are sort of the early creature to suffocate in a mine uh, where gas is developing, the canner in the mine analogy. Is there something terrible happening? Uh, or is it just that at some point people realize that there is, well, there is actually a risk here? I mean, let's remember, these are instruments supposed to absorb risk. It's a bit absurd how you see the press complain about asset uh, li bank liabilities proving risky uh, after complaining for years the bank's liability did not absorb any risk. I think we're just seeing the sign of success. Banks have issue with bearing capital. I think that's very good, quite frankly. But still it remains the point that it's not good for a market to kind of be so shocked. So I'd like to actually have now a poll. I'd like to ask you what you think. I have here a list of potential explanations. I would ask you to uh, just vote uh, and sort of give your sense of which of these explanations seems most plausible. I'm really curious to see how how it goes. Um, interesting. Yes, I'm deciding up. Interesting, quite interesting. Let's say. Let me see, I'm not sure about the total number of participants, so what point I should call it off. All right, let's see. So interesting, uh, are people still voting? I guess we got it. Okay, so what we can see is that the poll the poll suggests that two main reasons uh, emerge. So the you know it's really far fetched to say that Deutsche Bank was about to breach its capital requirement uh, as a um, on a sort of uh, risk weighted base, has solid capital present. Um, and uh, the, the idea of conversion was not probably, in my opinion, the overwhelming consideration. What you voted most was uh, the idea that in the background, well, you know, there was a general sense that banks may default. Now, maybe not in the short term. So uh, the second most favorable, most voted answer is perhaps in the medium term there is a problem with bank profitability and therefore ultimately their solvency. And I think that is an issue in the current environment of interest rate. So there could be a recognition in the long term the banking sector is issue. Although of course, and, and that we have seen very much on, on the equity side. On the other hand, the drop in the bond side was, was quite large. And I think that one explanation is that the market sort of probably over, even overreacted to, the, to what you also consider the most likely uh, reason, which is the fact that suddenly people realize, wait a minute, we're not going to get a coupon this year if Deutsche Bank is so unprofitable. And that was uh, of immediate cash flow significance. So a majority of you takes that view. I tend to take that view. There is an issue that people had sort of, sort of forgotten a bit that aspect. That's quite possible. I think exposed, we can see the market overreacted. But let me say solidly, I personally think it's uh, it's very good that the market uh, recognize these are risk instruments because they are, they should be. Um, so I think we're going to um, go back to the presentation. Um, so now on, the, on a very important question, which in the end uh, proved to be more academic. So currently, all COCO have book equity triggers, uh, which means that their conversion can only happen when the accounts are filed. And, um, and the trigger is invariably based on level tier one capital ratio, which is, of course, the most binding instrument at the point where you breach that the bank will be for sure taken into a resolution process, uh, which is the sort of modern version of uh, you know, 
bankruptcy, sort of the, the pre-bankruptcy or instead of bankruptcy process that we have created in European legislation. Now, so we rely on this accounting number. How effective would they have been? Um, yeah, so how effective would it have been to rely on Markovus and Burke? So here is another poll. Would a Markovus equity trigger have performed better during and um, before the um, before and during the crisis in terms of singling out uh, the banks that need recapitalization? I'd like you to vote. Um, you know, the framework is the markets did not see exactly the crisis coming. Um, there were a lot of criticism on that. Um, how well would have another indicator worked in the middle of a crisis? So please answer. Would you? Which one would have would have performed better? Um, so interesting numbers are coming in. All right. It's fairly balanced so far. All right, I think the one of you that will vote will pretty much have voted by now. Oh, I can choose to broadcast results. So uh, I think I'm going to end the poll. Oh, let's vote. One more. Three, two, one more. Uh, is someone reluctant? Yes. OK, there are still people voting. One more. All right, let's make broadcast there. Yeah. Um, so, a slight majority goes for for market would have performed better, um, but actually many do not know, and actually it's uh, fair enough. Uh, so let me go back to how do I go back? Um, yes, to the presentation. So look at this beautiful graph, courtesy. Um, so, what you have in the first in the first panel is how well book of equity or banks did during the crisis. Did very well, actually. <laughs> um, and what is interesting is that the red line is the book equity or banks that had serious trouble. I don't know what happened here. Um, Okay, I don't, I don't understand. Oops. So what, as you can see, the, the banks that had uh, trouble in the end had better book to equity numbers. Always reassuring, isn't it? Now, what you can also see is that market, uh, market to book ratios were way too optimistic um, for a long time. They woke up at some point, in fact, mid 2007, which is by some measure too light. But what you can see is that there were some information market prices between those banks in the end got tr in trouble and the others. Actually, I think it's kind of troublesome that the two things diverge. You know, book equity actually becomes less informative as market uh, becomes more informative. And you would have had more conversion with market. Now, so why they are you know, market triggers? Uh, well, you know, let's think of the positive of market accounting triggers. So they're easy to implement. Um, um, the accounting value, however, may be flattered. You know, you've heard this before, right? So bankers, of course, have a bias towards saying everything is fine. But it's also true that the regulator may like forbearance, you know, never like bad news to be released to the market because of, you know, contagion, this sort of mysterious thing. So um, what we have to realize is that because every single COCO issue out there has an accounting trigger, an accounting trigger de facto are going to be activated by book reporting that is going to be subject to de facto regulatory approval, book trigger is a regulatory trigger. So in fact, all the triggers we have are a discretionary regulatory trigger, I'd say. Um, now, it's true that, so maybe it's right to give regulators this power, and only them, um, and they have indeed the 
ability to say, well, we will activate this thing when the bank has reached a point of non-viability. So even if, in a sense, the bank were to be reluctant to, to sort of publish its account, uh, because they, they would reveal the triggering, well, the regulator have, under the resolution of power, um, uh, under the new power on the on resolution authority. What about the market trigger? I like the trigger image here. Well, you know, let's not be silly. Uh, first of all, market price may be manipulated, um, or markets may be wrong. Um, now, one issue that has concerned many researchers that have looked at this is that de facto cocoa conversion is designed in practically every issue uh, to imply a loss of value for the bond holders. So even when you have a conversion to equity, the terms are de facto such that the equity loses value. Um, one of the constraints is that you have a fixed conversion ratio. Uh, and, and so unless you convert um, along a sort of a sample path that is continuous exactly at the point at which you have a, a that fixed conversion, um, a sort of a, sort of no, no value transfer, uh, de facto you will break through a barrier and that barrier typically is designed to be the fair conversion price. And so what appears to be true, that's what the data also says, is that there is a gain to there is a capital loss to, to COCO when they convert, um, at least relative to non-conversion. So now, if the market can be manipulated, um, and we know that there's a problem, multiple equilibria also in that amount, uh, the, one idea is to have a double trigger proposed by some, um, in which essentially what you have is that the market uh, price would signal the need for conversion and then that will sort of be a first switch. The second switch has to be essentially pulled by a regulator upon scrutinizing the circumstances that would be able to filter out market manipulation pretty easily. So that would might be the best of a world in which you have pressure from the market to act which might be useful uh, in the face of regulatory forbearance um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, some filter. Now, let's come back to this question. Uh, so why are all, why are all COCOs issue of accounting trigger? Um, I have three questions for you. I might be, I'm very curious what you think. Let's see what the poll says. Okay, votes are coming in fast. Right, let's see. Very interesting. Okay, I think we we all pretty all have voted. One more, no more. I think we we all have it. All right, I'm gonna publish the result now. So, interestingly, the opinion are divided. Um, people seem to have a certain trust in accounting numbers here that might reflect in part mistrust of market values. And I think uh, either because of manipulation uh, or irrationality, the markets did not cover themselves in glory during the credit boom in terms of detecting risk. Although it's not clear that you, given the exposed bailout, it was entirely irrational. Um, interestingly, also the awareness that you have that you know there's a big battle about controlling the trigger. I don't need to tell you this. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Um, how do I do that? Okay, so um, I don't know why it moves by itself. So some thought I had before I saw your result. Um, 
yeah, banks cannot control their share price, but you know, they certainly control accounting numbers. But so do regulators. In fact, you could claim that regulators control accounting number even better than bankers, at least if they choose to. Um, and you know, after the crisis, people think they know better. There's also an issue, and someone brought it up in the chat line, that sort of at a time where the market are falling, a conversion is a bad thing. I'm not sure I understand that. I actually disagree. I think that if markets are falling and bank debt is converting to equity, that's good. I think that's what should happen. Now, of course, ideally, you want this to happen on an idiosyncratic base. So this bank is in trouble, everybody else is fine, it converts, uh oh, but yeah, everybody's fine again. Now, if you want to, you could say that the market gets spooked by the conversion, but you know, it's, the last time I, re I looked, um, the market was spooked by bank default, not by bank recapitalization. Um, what is certainly true is that investors might welcome it much better because exposed, there'll be much fewer conversion uh, under a regulatory trigger. And some of my ongoing academic work suggests that that might be a case, not least uh, because of regulatory forbearance. I'm of course talking about theoretical work. Okay, now maybe the last very important question, do we convert in equity or or do we write off debt? Um, well, there are two forms of bank bond conversion. You can deleverage by less debt or more equity. They're different in fact. Equity conversion cuts the debt, and uh, but it dilutes owners. Um, principle of write down reduces straight debt and benefits owners. Now, when you say dilute owners. Um, I think there is some misunderstanding here, including in, in the academic papers, uh, in the empirical papers on Coco out there. It is true that dilution is not necessarily welcome, but strictly speaking, when you convert, you're eliminating a liability, and you're, yes, you get some other co-owners, but whether you get a dilution depends whether the terms are favorable or unfavorable to shareholders. And let's remember the COCO are de facto, de facto uh, designed to sort of suffer a value transfer upon conversion. So I think the dilution issue here is treated with a bit too much ease in the commentary. Now, psychologically, it might matter, but you have to be a little careful before you say that dilution is a bad thing. If you get more owners, but what you lose is the liability that is actually worth a lot more than what you what you need to share. That's a capital gain for existing shareholders. Now, here is something about some information about the type of loss absorption. Uh, it's a bit hard to read, but you can see the principal write-off are, are, are important. And more uh, interestingly, it was just not a mechanism that was originally expected to be dominant, but it did become dominant. Interestingly, one of the first COCO that had that feature was the Rabobank uh, issue that was issued by a bank that had no equity because it was a, uh, was a cooperative bank, and therefore they can only do the write-off part. But uh, it certainly was followed up. Now, why is principal write-down so popular by and large, unexpectedly, let's say, I mean, more than half? Is it more effective deleveraging? Simpler to understand? Is it a control issue? You don't have dilution with new guys coming in and telling bankers what to do. So I'd like to open a poll. Uh, I find it very interesting to get this feedback. Um, I get more feedback from you than I get from my students who are uh, generally a bit shy, but uh, maybe anonymity helps. So, it, oh, that's really interesting. Really interesting what you're saying. Uh, we've got a broadcast results. When we finish. Oh, maybe I shouldn't because then you get influence. I shouldn't do that. Um, yes, I'll wait for two more and then I close. We'll be the lucky two. All right, here, close the poll. 
Oops. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. So most of you think there is a control issue. I think that's very much the case that certainly smaller banks control issues have been a barrier to the capitalization in several countries, for instance, in Italy. Um, the, uh, for the large banks, well, you know, maybe. It's, uh, it's a very interesting idea. I mean, to the extent that you can buy shares, but you don't buy shares more cheaply by buying cocoa. I mean, you, the conversion turns are a bit unfavorable. But it's true that all at once you get a chunk of new guys. And so there's a discontinuity. Uh, your second preferred choice is simpler to understand. And uh, as I'll show you, there might be something to it. Um, the least favorite one is the one about being effective to, to the leveraging, only 15% only thing. So. All right, um, shall we go back to the presentation? Thank you. Um, so let's talk about the effect of um, what is the effect of these two forms of conversion? So which one actually is the best preventive effect? I mean, this is a conceptual question. Of course, it depends on contractor terms. So you have small write-off and a big conversion. I mean, it makes a big difference. So it depends how much you write off. Uh, to some extent. Um, but by and large, what is true is that the bondholders upon conversions get less in a write-off than in, in an equity conversion, uh, unless you have a, such a dramatic drop in the share price upon uh, the share moment of conversion. I mean, that's, that's also a possibility. Um, but it could be that in terms of yield, and this is something that empirically might need to be studied, um, the principle of write-off of a high yield. Um, what is a clearly an advantage, and I've seen it in my experience on, in this area, is that pure uh, debt investors um, like Coco when there is no equity conversion feature, because apparently they are debt people and they are equity people in the market. That strikes me as strange. It's not the way we, write, we think uh, asset pricing works, but that's the way markets work. The markets are actually a lot more segmented than we think in terms of type of investors. Now, I'm just going to give you some visual here. I did some quick job here and give you a sense um, of the two form of conversion. So here you have both type of conversion described. So imagine here we get uh, this tool that uh, here we put the value of the firm tomorrow, and here the value of the claims. So this is a classic uh, equity payoff. So let's say that before, before conversion, this is the value of the equity. This is the value of the debt, deposits plus the convertible. And then you have two type of possible conversion. One is you just delete some leverage. And that is just a shift of the curve of your payoff. The other is you sort of flatten the payoff while deleting leverage, uh, presumably more. Uh, other things being equal, if you assume the same face value. Uh, you can see how the sort of risk incentive here are very driven by convexity around the point of value. So suppose conversion happens somewhere here, let's say. There's going to be a point where for a given distribution of, of as possible asset value, one thing will produce less attraction, uh, make debt less attractive or more attractive. It depends a lot essentially on the, um, uh, on the gamma of the option uh, that equity represents here. So uh, I think these are just highlighting the two mechanisms. Uh, essentially, will depend very much on detail or the contractual terms. Um, I know I always go on a bit too long. I'm told I, um, you know, 
talk like uh, this were not a webinar, but uh, it is. So let's come back to what I think are the highlights. First of all, what is specific about contingent convertible DAC is that it's designed to deliver the lever and the leveraging is going concern. It's supposed to convert even before resolution. In fact, when it converts as resolution, it's actually not very different than that, uh, than believable that. There's not much uh, point in having so much fuss about it because in the end it's like believable that takes the loss. Uh, that's done. Um, what is really unique, the part that really deserves more attention is conversion is going concern without triggering a resolution. It's certainly not bankruptcy. And that's uh, and then potentially this deleveraging at a stage in which the bank is still alive will have effect on sort of the projection of uh, risk return trade off for those who decide about riskiness of the bank. Um, to have a preventive effect, they have to have a high trigger and a good trigger. So the key point of Coco for Coco to deliver an economic value is that the trigger is informative about risk incentive. It's not just a matter of taking losses. You know, any form of that will do that at default. What is the claim here is that Coco can do better than that because it can actually discourage risk uh, before default. So, but for that to work, it has to be that the trigger is good, meaning informative, meaning activated when the time comes, when, when, inf when the incentive to risk taking are being, are increased because of losses. The concern, the main concern, is regulatory discretion actually trigger. Um, I think that uh, I fear more too few conversion than too many. I am a big fan of conversion. I mean, of course, I prefer banks not to suffer, but to the extent that they do, it's better to convert early rather than keep pretending things are fine, which is what too often is done. Um, and some of the evidence about uh, that I haven't had time to discuss that is coming out in academic papers is that m banks seems to recognize that the issue of COCO has some effect on the riskiness of the uh, of other form of debt and of the bank overall. Thank you for your patience. I hope I didn't go too much over both. I'm happy to take questions. And I see some of you have been shooting away at it. So. Let's declare open the, the, the question. Let's see. In some of the question, like Ercole, I think we talked about procyclicality of conversion. I think many of you echo some of uh, their comments on uh, why accounting triggers are common. Um, actually, really, it's interesting that your comments seem to align with some of my impression, including the fact that there is a segmented market for, uh, for investors to debt and equity. Um, OK, there is a question about COCOA's executive compensation scheme uh currency i think it's a good idea um i think it's a good idea i mean it would be the first time that you've given yeah it's um i think it's a good idea let's uh, let's leave it at that and they it's uh, the advantage is that you are making payoff to bankers condition long term um, risk, which is exactly what we didn't do. Um, let's say, um, well, I like very much this question. So since, uh, Angelo say that since, um, um, if we don't think that the market trouble on the cocoa market resulted from a, uh, from the fact that suddenly people woke uh, thought that the banks were going to default or convert, 
maybe one explanation is market pressure to obtain a coupon payment. I love it. It's, uh, it's, it's super strategic thinking. I mean, first of all, yeah. Well, the point, I, I think that my, certainly commentary market participants about how risky this stuff was they bought and how the authority had to do something about it um, is very much the tone that markets have been taking, and particularly central bankers, but you know, possibly also with regulators. Um, it's a bit hard to imagine that people would literally take losses in order to, to sort of uh, prove a point. Uh, so I don't know exactly how you would profit from selling overselling. But uh, I certainly am convinced that if not by trading, certainly by the rumors the market makes, um, uh, they are very keen to keep saying, don't you allow to let us take uh, any losses. And this is, uh, this is a game that will continue. It's a bit troublesome that financial journalists seems to take that view. I think it's their the job of this uh, security take losses. Um, Someone asked why the U.S. does not incentivize cocoa. I'm actually talk to people at the Fed. They say, you know, you don't understand common law, um, legal doctrine. It's just it was impossible to to win the argument. These uh, were a dead instrument. So I leave it at that. Um, are you aware of cocoa that provides for debt reinstatement if things get better in the years? I'm not aware of it. I think it's against the principle, but I, I, that doesn't mean, I think it's not possible, but I'm not sure. Right, could you clarify how cocoa are treated for tax purposes in Europe? No, I'm sorry, I'm uh, not, not good at this. I do not know. Um, do we think, uh, Diego asks, uh, does the turmoil in January also reflect the lack of transparency about the bank exposure? Um, I'm not sure how to comment on that. It could be that our present market investors are very alert to the notion they there might be losses hidden in banks' balance sheet. That's a problem with accounting numbers anyway. Uh, but then again, you know the conversion is, uh, is based on accounting numbers. So as long as, if there are hidden losses and they stay hidden, there won't be conversion unless the regulator gets uh, get, get a bit serious. Um, and I think the response of the response of public opinion to the distress on the cocoa market was a bit of problematic. I mean, I think it's fine that these markets uh, gyrate, they move. I mean, they move too much, but that should be the commentary because they recover pretty fast also, although not fully. So, I don't know. I hope my potential regulator will not be too influenced by this. Um, I see. There is something about temporary write-down cocoa, so there might be more there than I'm aware of. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take I'll look, take a look. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, contagion issue. That's a good one. So we don't know who's holding cocoa. What about other banks holding cocoa? I think uh, micro pool regulators are extremely keen on that, but I don't know the facts. Do I think the CRD4 sanctions for institution hold cocoa? A linked institution create the right incentive. I don't know if the sanction is adequate, if that's your question. You certainly do not want to have too many cross-holding. Uh, cross um, Peter Kran has been very adamant that this, uh, this type of security should be held outside the sort of banking sector. And I think uh, the recommendation on EGA, he contributed to the LICAN committee was along those lines. Um, let's see. A bit more of a technical question, which I don't really understand. Uh, I don't know what an HF long short is. 
um, I guess I'll get more information here. Let's see. A hedge fund, a long short hedge fund of BD collectively price the option. Uh, I guess the question here is about the pricing of cocoa. That would be a topic on which um, I I, th I thought about it quite a bit theoretically, but I haven't looked enough at data. It's certainly not a trading strategy, so I I'm not sure I have something to comment on on that. Um, well, I, I like very much the, the sort of suggestions um, brought up here also for further thinking. Um, f uh, I've worked with Natalia Martinova on, uh, on this topic. We actually compare characteristics of cocoa in terms of their risk uh, prevention effects. Um, it's, uh, it's probably out as a that central bank working paper, but it's available, you can ask. Uh, thanks for the interest uh, in this. I see some, wait, there are a couple of more questions. Very good. Um, how does the tea like? Um, hi, Enrico, can you hear me? Um, I'll just uh, step in and say thank you for the uh, seminar. Uh, judging from the comments, people seem to be quite immersed. People seem to have quite enjoyed it, but I will have to uh, nudge you in the direction of the clock. So why don't you take one more question, one just one last question, and then we'll call it a day. Very good. Um, of the last question propose. Oh, here, um, John asked about whether the additional going concern loss absorbing capacity held by bank on the TLAC, can you think of that as a form of COCO with a different trigger? I think I go back to a bit the sort of current theme also in the first webinar. It is um, um, TLAC debt is designed to sort of take losses, uh, gone concern, or in any case, resolution. The bank might not actually fail, but it will be resolved. Uh, and so the old shoulders are wiped out. No, I do not think that a lot of TLAC is equivalent to have, um, to have um, a cocoa with a higher... I mean, there is some parallel. But I think the problem remains that uh, a lot of TLAC still represents leverage. Um, of course, if you have a lot of it, a lot of the lo risk taken by uh, by the banks will be borne by the market, which is which is good. But um, but I do not think that TLAC holders are an ability to control the risk, and the high leverage that is implicit in TLAC is worse than uh, uh, the kind of uh, implicit equity going concern that uh, high trigger cocoa has. So I think there's really a conceptual difference an important one. For people interested in this theme, I'll be teaching a course of financial regulation under in, in the under the platform of the Florence School uh, in uh, November, December, um, and it will this will be some of the thing we'll be elaborating on. Okay, excellent. Uh, Enrico Porti, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone who turned up and who um, asked questions and who enjoyed the webinar. We, we love it when you're so interactive. If you missed last week's uh, FBF webinar on debt buffers, I'm just going to leave a little link in the Q&A section. That is to our YouTube channel where we recorded last week's webinar and you can watch it there. And if you subscribe to that YouTube channel, there will be a video of this webinar popping up at some time in the near future. And if you want to find out more about us at the Florence School of Banking and Finance, you can visit fbf.eui.eu and you can be the first to know about events such as this. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Enrico. And uh, Thank you. we will see you next time. All right. Bye, everybody.